Good afternoon. This is Campbell McCreary here at Anvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Anvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Legend Mining Limited. Legend trades on the ASX as LEG. Um, hope you'll enjoy today's program. It will be available in replay mode. Feel free to chat in your questions. In the question pane at the GoToWebinar control panel or simply email them in. Um, Anvest is a New York-based specialist in investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource sector. And um, all important, uh, this call is for informational purposes only. And um, a replay of this event will be available in about an hour after we finish up today at anvestcapital.com slash webinars and find your way to the replay section. Uh, very pleased to have with us today Mark Wilson, who is the managing director of Legend. Mark, if you want to share your screen and turn on your webcam. Uh, an engineer by background, extensive business um, experience, uh, mainly in corporate management and project engineering. Uh, this is include site management, of remote construction projects, 10 years of commercial construction, the founding proprietor of a Perth-based company. In the past 20 years, an executive, non-executive consulting and owner roles in resource-focused companies. Um, after the formal presentation, uh, members of Anvest Capital will jump on and we'll uh, hopefully get some of the questions that you've sent in as well. And uh, we'll uh, have, a, have a chat and give some good questions. So uh, welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks very much, Campbell. Um, this is Legends first ever foray into the uh into the north american market so um everybody who's uh listening in's got the first mover advantage because nobody else up your way has seen this before um it's a a story which i i hope i leave you with the the scale of the the project i hope i leave you with the prospectivity of our project the fact that we've had great success to date, but there's one hell of a lot more to come. And that's the story that I'd like to be telling you today. Um, our cover shot there, which I always like whenever I'm going into new jurisdictions, just to give a bit of uh, color and flavor of the topography, the vegetation, the color of the earth. And when we use the term massive nickel copper sulfides that stick of core in the right hand photo that you can see is what a massive sulfide looks like and the excitement on site when the driller drills through this stuff is just palpable because the first clue that you're into it is the drill water that comes out of the um the drill hole turns black and people know that they're onto something that could be exciting. And when a stick of this shiny stuff comes out of the barrel, you've got geologists high-fiving, back-slapping, and uh, generally carrying on. So I'm just trying to get myself clicking along here. There's our normal disclosure. Um, a quick uh, rundown of the contents of what I'd like to talk to you about today. I think it's important to understand that nickel's our commodity and the nickel market commentary is essential to our rationale for, for spending our shareholders' money. Um, I guess I should paraphrase here, we're an exploration company, Greenfields Exploration. This is where you get the great uptick in the hockey curve of the hockey stick curve of success. And it's this uplift that early investors get the benefit of. I'll run through legend as the investment case, our project, our people, our cash and our shareholders, the location. Mawson is our main prospect. And this is the one where we have got the fourth discovered massive nickel copper sulfide in this entire area which stretches the best part of 
400 kilometres long and 50 kilometres wide. It's about a 20,000 square K zone, uh, which we call the Fraser Zone. And Legend controls 3,000 square kilometres of this. And so it's not just about Mawson, it's about the regional prospectivity, which we've been developing since we've been here for the last five years. And then quickly wrap up with the programs that we're doing at the moment and a summary of this investment case. So with the nickel market commentary, um, nickel has been a very dynamic uh, marketplace, especially in the last three or four years. Up until that time, the London Metal Exchange, the LME, completely dominated the discussion about nickel price. That's where you went. There were apps on your telephone which gave you the clues. And that blue graph to the top there is the history of the nickel price in US dollars a pound over the last five years. And you can see from that five years ago, it was pretty much in the doldrums when we started our project, um, $4 a pound. And like most markets, they don't go up in straight lines. There's ups, downs and all overs. And today we're trading at $7.40 a pound. And the red line on the bottom is the inventory. And in broad terms, you can see as that inventory has deplenished over five years, the price has steadily increased. And it's, it's really an economics 101. If, if something gets in shorter supply, the price goes up. But in the last couple of weeks, there's been quite a dramatic decrease in the price from $9 a pound back to this $7.50. I would see that as just a, a, a trading blip. Uh, traders determine these short-term prices, not the genuine suppliers or the um, consumers. And you get these wild swings in nickel from time to time. Stainless steel consumes 70% of nickel's use. And Indonesia is now the epicentre of uh, the world nickel production because of the absolute um, uh, massive resource of nickel laterite. This recent price decrease is often talked about by some commentators where there's been a lot of Chinese investment in Indonesian nickel in the last um, uh, five to 10 years. And that's principally because it produces a, a product called um, nickel pig iron or MPI, which is the primary input to stainless steel. Um, a lot of the market commentators talk about the impact of the electric uh, battery market, electric vehicle battery market, and the predictors for the nickel consumption of that going out 2025 is just as I've said there, sky's the limit, which is a term I've, I've got from Macquarie, so it's not something that I'm using loosely. But the key for legend is typical in these projects, from discovery to production's a five-year cycle. And that means Legends nickel safely in the ground without a big massive uh, capex eating its head off, which gives Legend a very positive profile for a successful project going into a market where the demand is very high. This graph here is something that Macquarie Strategy put out just this month. And this is where I'm talking about the sophistication of this market changing. The light blue line on the top is the nickel sulfate battery grade, which you can see is trading at a higher price than the LME with that sudden drop that we spoke early on the previous slide. And the darker blue line down below is the NPI price. And traditionally, <clears throat> both the NPI and the nickel sulphate have been quoted as either a premium or a discount to the LME price. These days, with the Shanghai metal market coming in, they're actually pricing 
each of these different types of nickel in reflecting the true value. And what has been a, a speculated development recently is that the Chinese in Indonesia are managing through a through a, a sulfite, uh, an acid leaching process to convert this NPI to a battery compatible nickel. They're talking about three to five thousand dollars a ton to do that and keeping in mind that the N NPI production price is in that seven and a half to eight thousand or these are US dollars a ton. So the speculation here is that the to produce the battery compatible nickel you're going to be looking at something around twelve odd thousand dollars a ton and the market today as we speak is 16,000. So that's pretty much trading to an acceptable commercial um, uh, margin for a producer. <clears throat> but one of the things I'll talk about later is some metallurgical test work that we've done with our particular uh, metal. It puts us squarely in the frame to have the same material as what a, an Aussie company IGO is producing at Nova. And they are producing this material at around 4,000 US a ton because of the nature of the material that we're using. We're starting with the nickel sulfide. The Indonesians are starting with the nickel laterite. And we get copper and cobalt credits, which bring us right back down into the lowest quartile of production, which is extremely attractive for IGO and for Legend in the future. So quickly about Legend, we've got a market cap of 330 million Aussie dollars now at our current price. We've got cash at December of 27. Um, since that time, we've got a, a two and a half million R&D rebate from the ATO and three million of some option exercise. So there's actually an extra five and a half million cash in our treasury. Um, with that option exercise, our top 20 changed a bit. Um, our major shareholders are Creasy Group, 30%, IGO, 13. I'm the Wilson Group with 6.2, with plenty of skin in the game. And Bailey Group round out our top four. And the minute you ever see the top four shareholders ticking past six o'clock on that clock, you've basically got a tightly held structure. We have no debt. Our board of directors have been very stable with a broad range of professional capabilities. Michael's uh, an accountant and a very experienced company director as our chairman. I'm an engineer. Oliver's our recent appointee to the board. Uh, a 10-year experienced geologist, specifically in this Fraser range. And Tony Walsh, our company secretary, very high-end experienced in terms of um, governance, which is an important aspect today. And the executive team are rounded off with Lynn, who's our office manager, and Derek, who's our exploration manager. That team's been together for the last five years while we've been working on this project and uh, the success of it I think simply points to the success of the future rather than that of the past. We do take our ESG obligations very seriously and all about stakeholder relationships and I just to steer you to our website to see those policies. The investment in legend is really about the people, the project, the cash and our shareholder structure. The, the, the people I've touched on, but onto our major shareholders, Creasy Group and um, IGO, both of those parties have been very successful in this area in the Fraser range in the past. Um, IGO operates the Nova mine, which is the mine that's the only operation in this area and Creasy is the largest shareholder of IGO. Um, 
our location with this 3,000 square kilometres of very underexplored nickel terrain with great infrastructure, which I'll touch on down the track. Um, the, the prospectivity of Nova and the regional targets and with nickel, our future facing commodity and the delivery of success to date where our share price just tracked along between one and two cents for the best part of four years. And then in the late 2000, uh, 2019, we got our first success, which really started to reflect capital growth, which is about success. So where we are, um, 300k east of the central inland town of Kalgoorlie, uh, a thousand kilometres east of Perth. And I think the important thing with this slide is to note that the Trans-Australian Railway Line runs right through the southern part of our tenements. That's a huge capex advantage for development because you've got a transport corridor to get your construction materials in to build your mine and a corridor to get your product to market. That transport corridor goes straight to the, the nickel plant in Cambalda or to the ports of Esperance in Perth and just enables product to market in a very cost effective manner. I think this next slide is probably the most important slide from a North American perspective. It's the story slide and in the 1960s the Canadian Geol Society identified this Albany Fraser belt of having analogies to the Thompson Belt in Canada. Um, they sent Newmont out here. Um, Thompson Belt has 2.7 million tonnes of nickel endowment. This belt to date has only got 300,000 tonnes. Newmont came out, did some early work in the early 70s and a commodity cycle wiped them out and they went home. Our major shareholder, Mark Creasy, who was a prospector in those days, was out looking for bits of Skylab, which is a satellite that fell from the sky and was predicted to have landed in this area in the 1970s. And he bought all the geo survey maps from basically the south coast of Australia to the north. And out there under his lamp in a tent, he actually saw that Newmont had drilled a hole which had four centimetres of 4% nickel and 2% copper. That was the pay dirt that the Canadian Geol Society was predicting. And if you fast forward then to 2012, when a company called Sirius drilled the first hole into Nova, that took Sirius on a three year journey from a 10 million market cap to a 2 billion market cap. And the company that took them over at 2 billion, IGO, is now producing nickel at that mine for, as I said, $4,000 a tonne. It is hugely profitable. That's the story that legend wishes to emulate. And that's the story that we have had major success along the path of with our discovery at Mawson. This slide here gives you the main players. Legend is the leverage play simply because we control that central gravity high, which we would argue is 50% of the best ground in this zone. And from it, it's, it's really difficult to comprehend, I know, but there, there had not been a single hole into fresh rock in our entire project area when we first came across this project. The area has covered with transported soils. That's one of the physical differences between this and Thompson Belt because Thompson Belt's been scraped clean by your glacial movements and the fresh rocks poke out of the ground. For us, there's this layer of up to 150 metres of transported cover, which basically means that standard prospecting techniques of rock chip sampling and soil sampling don't work. You have to drill deep. 
Legend is the first company that's drilled into fresh rock in this area. And for us to have had this Mawson discovery in our first five years of being out there is one hell of an achievement, a feather in the cap of our technical people. But please believe me, it is only the beginning of the story. This can go to multiples, as I demonstrated with Sirius's experience of the 10 million to 2 billion in, in three years. And when we get on to what we're getting on to, that's the sort of payback that uh, investors can expect. So now into a bit more detail of the actual project. This is a blow up of the mag of the Mawson intrusive complex. The top left hand gives you where it is in our project area. 16 kilometres through a, a central axis, six kilometres across. It's interpreted as a, a cluster of intrusives. The dark blues in those photos or the, the, the back screen there are mag lows. <clears throat> And basically these intrusives show on mag maps as lows. You can see where in that central area we did a lot of the EM, which is the geophysical technique of pumping electricity into the ground, measuring the response, which tells us that we've got conductive bodies and the some of the drill patterns around which we've been. But we basically have to use geochemistry from our air core drilling, geology and geophysics to find the targets for diamond. And that's how we go about discovering these massive nickel copper uh, occurrences. Our expenditure for this year in this particular 16 by six area is $8 million, which by any stretch of the imagination is a very, very uh, high level of spend for a company that earns no money and relies totally on the market for its cash. This next slide gives you an indication of how busy we've been in the last 12 months. I know all of those holes are too small to read on the screen, but basically they all indicate nickel, copper, cobalt hits in the drilling that we did over the last year. And the success of it really talks to the fact that what we've touched the top of here is a large nickel, copper, cobalt system. And that's what the program for this year is really about, drilling outside those areas and growing this knowledge. The ellipses on this slide talk to the areas that we're gonna focus this year. We've worked very hard to get a water supply agreement from the local station owner, <clears throat> which has only just come into effect at the start of March. That's enabled us to go to two diamond rigs. Up until that time, we had to cart water 300 kilometers along an unsealed road and then another 50 up to our, our campsite in triple road trains from, from Kalgoorlie. This is an enormous step forward, which has given us the capability to run two diamond rigs, the first of which started in the first week of March, and the second of which just arrived on site in the weekend just gone. We've got over 10,000 metres of drilling to do, and these target areas are really stepping south, north, and east of where we already know the mineralisation is, trying to trace the source and where it's generally gone. The metallurgy, which I touched on, really simply tells us that we can liberate this nickel off a simple flotation process, which keeps the costs low, which puts us square in the, uh, in the zone to be producing nickel at that $1.60 US a pound, $4,000 US a pound produces separate nickel and copper concentrates, they're high recoveries, it can be optimised, and we see this as a very big project enhancement 
and project de-risking because it demonstrates that the material we are looking to produce can be produced from what we've discovered. Our regional work, because we're not just about Mawson, we've got this entire 3,000 square kilometre area. All of those yellow stars on this slide are the areas that our geological technical team worked up during the period of December, January, February. Basically, it's extremely hot about out there at that time. You've seen the level of vegetation. The fire risk is enormously high to the extent that it's just not safe to work out there in those months. And so we tend to drill from March through to November and December, January, February are a regroup, assemble our information and plan for the future. And so all of these yellow stars are areas where we have done no work to date and we plan to do our regional Air Corps and EM. To the south, you've got prospects Worsley, Hurley, Preen, which we've already identified and following some work to get the necessary clearances to do the ground disturbing activities, we expect to be diamond drilling down there in the middle of this year. We spend one third of our money on this regional work and two thirds at Mawson. So out of the total exploration spend, the concentration's Mawson, but we are still developing all of these other areas and this slide in particular highlights some success that we've had with our air core drilling, which talks to the prospectivity for nickel and copper that we've uh, found in those specific areas. Legend runs a very small team, but with our experience in the district with um, uh, Creasy Group and Oliver's uh, experience there, we rely on the best science available to us here in Western Australia to feed in to our analysis of results that we've, that we've got. And whether it's using the petrology surface, services of Tony Crawford or Dick England, whether it's using the geophysical of uh, Southern and Mirror Geoscience, Southern Geoscience and more EM experts, Mirror Gravity, and then the structural work of, of John Standing and Model Earth, all of this best of class professional service feeds into Legend's analysis of what we've got. And I think that enables us to punch way, way above our weight. Our programs for the year, pretty basic with the diamond drilling and downhole EM at, at, um, at Mawson and the regional approach of moving, moving loop and air core with diamond drilling at, at Hurley and Crane. Spending our $12 million, doing it in a very economic and uh, sensible way, which I hope optimises success for the future. So, the story I hope you've heard is you really are, if you invest in legend, you're with the best of class in terms of people. We've got a project which we already have enhanced and de-risked with our Mawson discovery. The commodity of nickel is absolutely the sweet spot in the cycle to be in. And I hope you have heard the story from me that we truly believe we are on the cusp of further success. So thank you very much for that. Um, I hope that's shed some light on Legend's story. And I'd like to now flick back to uh, Stuart and Campbell at um, the Big Apple to fire out the, uh, the questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's jump in. Please send in your questions. Just uh, find your way to the question button and drop that down and should be fairly intuitive how to send a message or you can just email. Uh, the magnetic data indicates that the intrusive bodies may have been folded. If so, do you expect structural thickening of the mineralized zones? 
Campbell, that, that's a, a pretty good question um, because the you know the flat earth society basically went out when Chris, christopher columbus sailed across the atlantic and found out there was america so look you get all of this folding in these structures but the 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 basic process for these deposits to occur is the material comes up from the earth's mantle it's in a magma the the term for it is it's a chonolith, which is a, a mafic, ultramafic um, uh, lava flow. And it needs to intersect a sulfur source to precipitate the nickel and copper out of that solution into a body. And for that, you need a trap site. And so any of this discussion of folding obviously gives you a physical trap site where this can occur but you need all of those other ingredients in the pie before you're going to get that precipitation and our challenge at Mawson indeed we believe we found the chonolith it's bifurcated the stuff to the west is in a two to three um channel or intercept as you drill whereas to the east it's more a raft on top of a meta sediment and what we're trying to do is to trace that back down to the south to understand if that's the source of the mineralization mm -hmm. i know i've sort of beat around the bush a little bit with that question but you know the, the, there is no simple answer other than to understand the principle and then you need your technical guys to apply that principle to the specifics of what they're seeing on site. Um, any plans to list in the United States? Um, no, not at this stage. We find that um, the, uh, the costs of administering that uh, and the distraction can be uh, outweigh the advantages. And I think if we got onto our big deposit where we needed to access capital markets there, that would be the trigger for us to um, do a more thorough investigation of something like that. Although I am aware of this OTC, um, it's new to me at the moment. And uh, I suppose I should back up a bit and just say we never say no to anything. Jumping back into the projects, uh, you mentioned 20 new targets. What anomalies or drill hole data helped you to identify these? Which one do you trust more? Okay, well, there are no drill holes. We're just running off um, coincident mag lows with gravity highs. And in the presentation, you would have heard me talk about the cover. And so when Legend first went to the site, those photos you saw, you can see it a bit in the background there. You've just basically got vegetation on top of red transported cover. And, you know, it's up to 150, maybe an average of 80 metres below that when you get to fresh rock. And so we didn't have any drilling data, which I mentioned in the presentation. We simply had a mag map and a gravity map. And what we're looking for is interesting interpretations of that uh, gravity and mag, where we will then go out and do the geophysical surveys of innovative moving loop EM and air core drilling, which will tell us the depth, it'll give us the profile of the cover, it'll give us the geochemistry at the top of the fresh rock, and it'll tell the geos whether they're in the right rocks. So all of those targets are ripe for that EM and air core prior to deep drilling. Uh, any royalty obligations? Um, no, there are no royalty obligations, except I would point out that most of this ground is held in joint venture with Mark Creasy because he is, was the major owner. And the terms of that joint venture is he has a 30% free carry. 
And so he's not only Legend's largest shareholder, Legend owns 70%, but he has a free carry through to decision to mine, at which stage he has to um, either contribute, sell or uh, revert to a royalty. <clears throat> but at this point in time, no, there are no, no outstanding royalties. Could you compare and contrast to Nova uh, Bollinger? And um, for benefit of other people, could you tell us what Nova Bollinger, Bollinger is? Okay. Well, Nova Bollinger is what we're looking for. That, that's a mine of some uh, 14 to 15 million tonnes of material, 2% um, nickel, 1% copper ballpark. <clears throat> and the company that discovered it, Creasy was the largest shareholder, Creasy was the joint venture partner. Through those equity and joint venture positions, it is how he um, uh, acquired his 13 or 14 percent stake in IGO that there is today. And so Nova Bollinger was discovered in a diamond, in an RC hole, I beg your pardon, in 2012. It went into production four or five years later in 2016. It had a mine life of, uh, I think, about 10 years uh, when the operation started. And I'm fairly sure that IGO has put out a resource statement just recently that says there's still six years of mine life. And importantly, producing nickel at that $1.60, $1.70 US a pound, selling into a market that's $7.40 a pound today and has been as high as $9 just a couple of weeks ago. Um, remote sensing, satellite imagery analysis, are you doing using any of that? Is it helping? Um, Campbell, basically, I'm unaware of any remote satellite work. Um, there has been active discussions about using seismic, but basically, I think it stands to reason if you're using satellites or aeroplanes, you're flying over this terrain at a pretty rapid rate, and it all relies on a signal going down and then that same plane or satellite receiving the response coming back. <clears throat> and you can imagine if you've parked your, your plant on the ground and the signal's going in and coming back to a stationary object, your quality of information that you're going to get from that is one hell of a lot better than you're going to get from anything that's airborne. So look, I, I think what I'm really saying there is our project has moved past that style of um, uh, exploration to identify prospectivity. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Mark. I remember sitting at my desk in Perth when the serious when Nova Bollinger discovery happened, and uh, there was a big frenzy. But I, you know, I'm very familiar with who Mark Creasy is. But maybe, you know, for the benefit of everyone listening in North America, you know, you could touch on how you know, some background of him and how he's Australia's most successful prospector and I believe one of, as an individual, one of the largest exploration concession owners in Australia and especially the Fraser Range where you're operating in. And I think there was a slide on slide 11 and he's involved in that whole belt in various, there's various different com companies. But I thought what was interesting is, you know, Ollie, who works with you, used to work at the Creasy Group and, you know, really likes the ground that Legend Mining has. Yeah, Stu, thanks for that. And I, I guess um, it's a good pick up from you because <clears throat> uh, here in Australia, we assume so much that people know who this guy is. And um, uh, Mark's an English mining engineer. Um, came out here on a 10 pound uh, ticket. Uh, we disrespectfully call them 10 pound poms. But um, he worked at BHP 
and came over to here to WA, basically prospecting. He's had an enormous success um, in gold exploration uh, in the 80s, where he discovered uh, several gold mines and sold them on. And I, I think I'm correct. There was a, a rich list of Australians published in the Weekend Press here. And Creasy sits at 146. And uh, when I looked at the valuation, I think I I can identify a lot more um, uh, that he might have that isn't necessarily published there. But look, the other thing with Creasy is his involvement with Sirius. It's his involvement in this Fraser range. I mentioned that he was out there trophy hunting for bits of Skylab in the 70s when he recognised that Newmont had had the success. That started his love affair with the Fraser range. He's known as the father of the Fraser range here in Australia. And Sirius was his first big payday as a result of the thick end of $100 million of his own private money that he has spent exploring there over the last 40 years. So any success is not one of these overnight wonders. It's just come from persistence, it's come from hard work, and it's come from sunk capital. Um, I've known the guy for 20 years. Legends office here in West Perth is in the Creasy building. We are the only other company that occupies space in this building in West Perth, which is the epicenter of um, West Australian's Exploration Centre. And Oliver coming across to us, he had been sitting at Creasy's table for the last 10 years as his exploration manager. As such, he's had his feet under the table for every transaction that Creasy has done in the Fraser range for the last 10 years. And that goes back to the serious days, the IGO takeover, the legend joint venture, Galileo, and as you said, he's got his fingers in every pie of those companies mentioned on slide 11. And that relationship that we have at a personal level, that Oliver now brings into this company really feeds into that slide where I was claiming that we're using best of class in terms of the brain power of the Australian nickel um, market to feed into interpretation for legend to enable us to fast track from any expiration hole we get to understand what we need to do next is really fundamental to what I argue for Legend being an outstanding investment. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, and if looking at your share price chart, you know, if you could touch on what caused that big jump, you know, I guess towards the end of 2019. Yep. On, you know, yeah. December 2019 to, you know, May 2020. Yep. And so we were doing a diamond program at the end of 19, Stuart, and hole seven, which is only the seventh diamond hole that we drilled in this entire project, hit a two metre zone, which had about one and a half metres of massive nickel copper sulphide. And when we did the downhole EM from that, there was a conductor some 50 metres south. So when we hit hole uh, seven, the share price was at about four cents and went up to 12. And then the COVID scare of March last year occurred and we came right back down to about 5.2. And then the first hole we drilled last year, which was hole eight, hit 25 metres of massive nickel copper sulphide in three zones, uh, a five, an eight and a 12 from memory. 
but that really said to the market that hole seven had just winged it and hole eight was into it. And it's interesting to me because that question came up about the folded nature of the stratigraphy out there. When we twinned hole eight to get our metallurgical sample in uh, November last year, that's when we actually hit the 31 metres of contiguous massive. You know, that's a 10 storey building just five metres away from where you'd seen the three separate intercepts with some metaseds in between. And I think that speaks to the, the liquidity, the, uh, just the way this material, when it precipitates, just rips rocks off uh, foot walls and hanging walls, and you can get a lot of this uh, country rock interspersed in the mineralisation. Um, but really your question was about share price appreciation. When we hit that hole eight, there was massive speculation that we just had to do what um, Sirius did, which was drill out the ore body. That transpired not to be the case. Um, Legend was alerting the market at that time that we saw that material as remobilised and therefore we didn't believe we'd drilled into the source. That's still the case today. And I think part of that messaging has tempered that enthusiasm up to the 20 cents back to the 12, 13 that we are today. But our mission now is to find this, what we believe is the source of that mineralisation. Yeah, thanks for that um, explanation. And, you know, the drill program you're doing, how like how deep are some of the deepest holes you'll be drilling in this area? Um, Stuart, the, the second rig's actually extending one of the holes as we speak, which was already down to, to 500 metres. And that hole's probably going to go on to 800 to, to 900. And obviously that's a, a call the geologists make on site. But generally speaking, these um, expiration holes are somewhere between 300 and 400 metres, and they tend to be called once you're out of the mafic, ultramafic rock and into a country rock sequence. And once you go out of it, you basically get 50 metres into it. That gives you a good platform for your downhole EM to look back at the rock you're looking for and yep. go from there. So. Um, Look, it varies, but generally 300 to 400, but specifically the deepest one, which we're drilling as we speak, is going to be down 800 metres plus. Gotcha, thanks. Um, you know, if, if if you were to look back on this year's program, what would you feel is a successful kind of exploration, exploration program out here? At Mawson, it's finding more of the same. And um, I know I haven't spoken too much of it, Stuart, but I guess it stands to reason. When you've got this cover over the top, when you drill a hole and get into this mineralisation, you can drop one of these probes down the hole and do what they call downhole EM, which enables you to look around maybe 50, 70 metres radius around the hole. And that gives you a clue as to where the mineralisation is going and where to drill next. So at Mawson, what we're looking for is to extend that footprint of mineralisation and hopefully find what we believe is the source of this very large mineralised system that I spoke to on one of the early slides. But people should also not lose sight of the fact <clears throat> that part of our work has got Hurley and Crean drill ready subject to some um, heritage survey clearances and a little bit of EM work at, at Crean. So success for me in 2021 is going to be more mineralisation at Mawson and hopefully onto a resource drill out and further discovery of massive nickel copper sulphide within our project area. Yeah, well, thanks for that. I'll pass on to Artie. 
Thank you. Uh, so you produce uh, nickel concentrate. I'm wondering is its percentage nickel, uh, and is there any unwanted elements in it? Uh, how how uh, in initial opinion, how easy you can market that? Yep, Erdi, I don't have those. Um, uh, what percentage nickel figures at my fingertips, but from memory, it was a 15% concentrate there were absolutely no impurities and we were able to produce a separate nickel and copper concentrate but the the early work was it was very similar to what they're able to produce at nickel and you, you would understand that the art of this work is to optimize to get yourself into a sweeter spot but what we wanted to identify with this phase one site of work that the material floated and so we had a, a standard methodology to produce which meant that we had a product that we could produce at the low end of the cost scale and it was successful. <clears throat> uh, how much money you spent for the exploration last year and how much money you are planning to spend this year? Um, all up, a total budget of $12 million. That picks up about a million for our head office costs, so 11 million expiration. It'll be a very similar budget this year, um, depending on success, because uh, if we achieve what I want to achieve in terms of Mawson or Hurley, that could be the button that we've got to up the scale and increase the rate. But as we go into the year, basically $11 million across that project in direct in the ground exploration. Thank you. And can you please remind us uh, the best uh, or your favorite hole drilled today? Date? Oh, look, head and shoulders early is hole 34, which um, was uh, drilled in. Uh, November, December last year and from memory there were uh, 41.3 metres of massive nickel copper within that hole but within that 40 metres, 31 metres of it was just a contiguous intercept uh, of 2.8% nickel, 2% copper and 0.17% cobalt. It was just an absolute Mozza of a hole. Thank you, Mark. Campbell? What cobalt grades uh, do you have in the drill in the drill holes? Campbell, to date they're averaging at about 0.15%. Um, Nova across a, a resource, and you'd all understand that um, a drill hole gets diluted when you have to put those resource calculation envelopes over it. NOVA runs at about 0.08, but we seem to be consistently getting a higher copper and a higher cobalt than they're reporting at NOVA. But on the flip side, our nickel has been, we haven't run into any of the five and 6% nickel intercepts, which has been characterized by NOVA. So, it's the same system, but just a bit of a different chemistry. Okay. Um, are you all good with the permitting now? Anything that would require more permitting? Or uh, um, if not, you not for the way, way doing, to yeah. go in another direction, would you have to fill out some more paperwork? Yeah. So, Campbell, I think to, to, to go to a mine, you need environmental and uh, a whole lot of we call native title permitting processes mm -hmm. but for the work we're doing at the moment we are basically fully permitted we have agreements with the, the local native title people that still requires you to go out and do a heritage survey when you want to do ground disturbing work and that's the process we're in down at Hurley and Crean at the moment and at Mawson we've done our our first stage environmental work which isn't necessary for what we're doing at the moment but it will be necessary 
when we start talking about mining lease applications. So we're sort of demonstrating the ability there to be in front of the curve. All right. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, please share your feedback when we queue you for it. It'll get its way to Mark and his team. The replay will be available in about an hour at ambestcapital.com slash webinars. And um, Mark, I'll turn it back to you to close and maybe you can elaborate on why we might buy your stock now. Okay. Well, Campbell, just thanks again for the uh, facilitating for my um, for my first time up there. I feel very comfortable that with both the presentation that I've given and the questions you've asked, there's a level of understanding. But uh, mate, as to why you should be there, this company has the potential to, with 3,000 square kilometres. Sirius had 46 square kilometres when it found Nova. There was one shot in the locker for them and they nailed it. We've got this plethora of places, each of which could be another Nova, the first of which I'm hopeful is Mawson. So if you sort of try and scale the $2 billion that they were taken out on across that story, I think all of you have got calculators which uh, should say by legend. Excellent. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Good morning, Thanks, Mark. everyone. Cheerio, and thank you again. All the best.